All it's right. really You've written a lot of books. Yeah. This, this is conversational intelligence. I love that. When have you ever heard anybody talk about conversational intelligence? Judith Glazer does. And, um, and as you can see, she, I can talk to her for hours upon hours upon hours, read her books. Uh, all her books are, you know, go into the second, third, fourth, fifth printing. Tell me about conversational intelligence and, and what, what, and why, what are you, yeah, why you wrote it and what it's all about. Yeah, what it's all about. How many hours do we have? <laughs> do it as, take as many hours as you want. <laughs> so I have been trying to write that book um, since I was 14. And I'm not kidding, 14 years old. And that was seven years ago. At least a couple plus yeah. or minus. <laughs> uh, it, the book got rejected over 30 times. It got rejected over, uh, over a 10 to 15 year period. I wrote my other books trying to write that book. Did you hear that? <laughs> this bright, bright, genius person got rejected? So on many your times. I mean, and, so many her, times. And, and here you've had such success and you got such a following and she's helped so many companies and people and how they think and what you're getting is what people, you know, are paying a lot of money to get to come in and help them think differently about their business and you even got rejected. Many. And your many. other books sold, and, and you're all, all the time trying to... To write that one. Write conversational intelligence. Right. So, so wh why were they rejecting this? Um, because I was doing something that people felt uh, would not fit into the book publishing world, and that is the following. I would write about uh, leadership in the book. That has leadership in it. It also has relationship in it, talking about yeah. relationships. It has neuroscience in it. So why does our brain do what it does? And why do we have to know those kinds of things? And how to translate that science into easy to understand words. Like when I talk about the lower brain, it's got its amygdala, fires off cortisol. That's the kind of stuff you need to know. I, and this is real stuff. It's real stuff. I mean, I I'm mean, not making it up. She's right. not making this stuff up about right. the brain and thinking. And right. It's real stuff right. that I never knew. Mm -hmm. And that's why I've enjoyed our time together, and you will, but go ahead. Right. So I was putting it all together. Then I was putting things about anthropology or about the life cycle of a, a company and a culture. And they said, well, you can't put anthropology, which is culture, with leadership, with linguistics, with um, uh, you know, neuroscience. Where are we going to put it on the bookshelf? Right? That was one of the questions. Like, wow. Right. In other words, <laughs> is this a self-help book? No, it's not really. Is it leadership? Maybe. Is it business? I don't know. I don't know. You know, who's going to sell it? We don't even know where to put it. That was number one. That second one was, are you a neuroscientist? And I said, no, but I've been studying neuroscience since I was 14. I was reading medical books to learn this stuff, right, before yeah. they put yeah. it into classes. Well, you really should have a bunch of neuroscientists be writing it with you, and you should be the second author. I said, but it's my ideas. No, you you know you, you really don't get, you, you don't know. get it. You need to have the yeah. You got to have the big guys with the you know big degrees, and and so here I've been saving for my whole life since I was fourteen examples of conversations in my life and observing other people's lives that were transformational. Things happened in those conversations in the moment where one person all of a sudden got an idea that transformed their life. I would capture those stories. I literally have one after the other after the other from my parents and my growing up and my sisters and brothers to the teachers that influenced me to other people that I saw whose lives were changed. And people were and then I was looking for the chemical uh, neuroscience intermediaries what was going on and I was told that I wasn't prepared to do that but nobody was teaching that. In other words like you yes. had ideas yes. about things that nobody yes. was teaching. Yes. I was doing that as well. And I was keeping little books, like diaries and things like that, and drawing pictures to try to remember these little things when they happened and watch why did that happen the way it did. So uh, you want know, a story about a, a, one of the kids that, I, I mean, this, yeah. This, so yeah, yeah, when I was early in my career, I got to teach um, young boys who were the ages of 13 to 16. They were in what was called Hahnemann Hospital. It was a school program for kids that couldn't fit into public school. Okay. Some of them walked out on the edge, ledge and almost jumped over three stories. And they were, had emotional challenges because they didn't fit in. I was told that they didn't fit in and I had to create the curriculum. And so what I decided to do as I assessed them is that they were multidimensional and didn't fit into a typical classroom where you learn auditorily. You learn by listening, and then you get tested on it, and then that's what education focuses on. These kids were very physical, didn't fit into the classroom. Where they were disruptive, right? They were very visual. They didn't fit into the classroom. You're supposed to read. And so they didn't read very well. So I said, I'm going to tackle that first. And I, had, I sat them down at lunchtime while they were eating, and I read um, Catcher on the Rye, which is all about 13-year-old kids. Right? And I had them project themselves into it and be the story. 
and identify with it. What I was doing was triggering their mirror neurons. Now, I didn't know it back then. I had to learn those words because yeah. <laughs> that's only come out in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, so mirror neurons are in the prefrontal cortex, that very special place we were talking about, where you identify with something so much that you create an identity inside of you for whatever that story character was. Mm -hmm. And you learn from that character. It becomes part of you because you envelop it so much you identify with it. That's what I was doing for the kids. Didn't know it. Mm. But at the time we finished reading the book, now none of them had read books up to this point. They were 13 to 16. Yeah. Took them into the library and I said, I want you to pick a book and pick any book. And I, they said, well, how do we know? And I said, just walk around, read the titles. And when you feel something inside, when that title rings to you like it's special, then I want you to take the book off the shelf. So out of the six kids, five of them were able to do it in about an hour, an hour and a half, and one boy couldn't. And they said, we're all done. And I said, we can't go until the last guy does it. His name was Michael. And I said, everybody sit, read your books, let him go around and find his book. And I said again, just feel it, your heart beat differently and you'll notice which book is right for you. Walked around 20 minutes later, took the book off the shelf. He said, this is the one. I said, it's yours. He said, it's mine. Everybody went home that weekend. Monday morning they came in. This boy who couldn't read a book, who couldn't pick a book, came in and said, he hardly slept. I said, what are you talking about? He said, this is the first book I've ever read in my life. I got him wow. to connect. First of all, I got the kids to connect into the story. Here's another kid. Somebody's writing a book about you. You're 13. Here's a 13-year-old boy. Identify with him. Look at the, all the adventures he's going through. You could learn about people's adventures through books. They had to reframe what a book was. A book to them was, I can't do it. And by helping them get in the book and uh, t uh, um, connecting their, and opening up their mirror neurons and their heart, they were able to open up the part of the brain that you talked about earlier, that yeah. prefrontal cortex, where their thinking brain lived, where their ability to identify with other human beings and empathize with them lived. And they hadn't been getting much empathy from school because people kept saying they're different, they don't fit in. So they're feeling rejected and they're closing down that part of the brain that they need to be. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. And it, all right, I'm gonna ask you a question. I know the answer to this, but I wanna hear you talk about it. Do we ever top out and say, we've learned all we can possibly learn? We've got it as smart as we possibly can. Oh, no yeah. way. Not if, you're, not if you're gonna live with this part of the brain. No. <laughs> with that, yeah. we can. We can continue, as long as we are healthy, we can continue to just go to places we didn't think we could possibly get. We have billions of neurons, billions of neurons that are in our brain. Neurons love to connect. That's B. B. Billions with maybe a B. Trillions, maybe, maybe trillions, maybe with a T. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And what makes them healthy is connecting with new neurons. If neurons just connect with ones they know, we start to get habit patterns. Those habit patterns become hardwired into us and we limit what we do. We don't risk as much, we don't try new things. Does that make sense? Yeah. That, right? Yeah. And that's what we teach people to get into habits because part of it, we have to learn habits in order to get up every morning, brush our teeth, and not have to put so much energy into thinking about it. But when we get into habit patterns that close down our brain and stop us from thinking new things, we literally get older quicker, Yeah. right? Yeah. The people that are living over 100 now, they're more centenarians than ever in the history of the world. It's the heart, largest growing sector in the, in, in yeah. the, now, right? Because yeah. we're living healthy. We're thinking more. We don't stop, you don't close down just because you've, you're supposed to be 65 and retire. What's retirement? We're, neither of us are ever gonna do that, right? I don't wanna go to the villages in Florida and play croquet the rest of the day. I mean, <laughs> exactly. really? Yeah, exactly. I mean, really? It's, oh, it's so sad. I, I remember when I was 16 years old, my parents had a party. There's all their best friends. And I walked through the dining room and there was a woman sitting in a chair and she was crying. And she was all alone. I said, what's going on for you? And she said, it's over. And I said, what's over? She said, my life. And I looked at her yeah. and I'm like, I'm looking forward to being an adult. And then she's telling yeah. me life is yeah. over. And I said, what are you talking about? And she said, it's over because I'm 40 and I have nothing to live for. I don't, you know, I, she had no interests anymore. She had kind of done, she was, she gave up on life and just became, and I don't mean, because mothering is great, yeah. but she closed down all those thinking things that you're talking about, yeah. right? And so she was getting old and she was so sad. And that, at that point I said, oh my God, another thing I've got to learn how to do, I can never let myself get to that point in that young age, right? But it's almost the thinking that, you know, I work, I have babies and I'm a parent, I'm a mother, I'm a father, we get them educated, we work for them. And I'm just living for that day of retirement. Yeah. Because why? Because you hate your job so much? <laughs> or you're not growing your job? You, yeah. you, you're probably in a job where you're not developing that. That's right. What, what do you call it? 
the prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal <laughs> cortex. And and you're not growing and you and, and it's not exciting. Right. So you, you think it's going to be better at retirement because you're so miserable in your work. Right. Because you're not learning, you're not growing, and I want to go down and right. to, to Florida or somewhere it's warm and and do what? Ha- Watch television on. all day? Hang on. I called my uncle. There were four brothers, and uh, they're all deceased except for my Uncle Joe, who was the youngest. And I said, what are you doing? And he said, I have these. He was a doctor. Yeah. Doesn't practice now. But he said, I have these great parties. I said, what kind of parties do you have? And I was thinking it was, you know, social yeah. parties. He said, we have these book parties, and we get together, and we pick out the most exciting books that are being written by Nobel Prize winners that are being written by – so it's in the area of physics, whatever – we want to explore that we've never thought about before or studied. Yeah. We each get books and we start to play those books out with each other and look at the deep issues. And I thought, wow, this is like the role model that you and I are sure. talking about. Isn't it great? Yeah. Yeah. They said, so they could retire from one part of their life, but open up another part of their life. In other words, make yeah. this the rich part of their life. More thinking, more exploring, more discovering. 